Let's all get us on the book. Turn to page number 55. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Page number 55, and y'all can sit down. I know some of y'all had to run in here anyway. <laughs> page number 55. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, the roll is called a fire, I'll be there. When the roll is called a fire, It's a, um, a uh, 
good crowd for uh, a rainy afternoon. I woke up this morning, first thing I did was look out the window because I thought, well, you know, it's supposed to be like 90% chance of rain today, 80% chance. Well, it depends on which weather app you look at, you know. ABC says one thing, uh, NBC says something else, and Weather Channel says something else. And so you try to meld them together and average, and you might come up with a uh, with an answer. Uh, but anyway, uh, it kind of looked like everything was moving out, and all of a sudden uh, came out to come to church, and it was black, black in the south. And I'm going, oops, <laughs> we might get some rain. You know how you know how to be 100 full 100 percent foolproof, and whether it's raining or not, look out the window. Or stand outside. If a drop hits you in the head, it must be raining. <laughs> so, uh, we are probably better pro pro prognosticators. That's what it is. Let's try to, what's that word? Progr prognostic <laughs> prognosticators of the weather than the people who are supposed to be uh, have degrees and all of that. So anyway, appreciate you being here tonight. Don't forget to pray. Uh, for Miss Diana uh, Pearson, she is uh, uh, we. She's at home right now, but she'll be there between 6:30, 6:45 in the morning uh, for her surgery. And uh, uh, so, do be in prayer for her if you will. Uh, also, the gentleman, the lady who I uh, spoke with uh, on Friday, her son's name is Alex Divas, D-I-V-A-S and uh, he's supposed to be in Sanction Hospital and uh, uh, that's where she was taking him and she was supposed to call me and tell me and she did not so uh, waiting on on that call uh, as well but uh, do be in prayer if you will uh, and there's others pray for Miss Frankie and Brother Bill uh, and others that are ill uh, that uh, God would undertake for them I know that uh, Wednesday night uh, Miss Maggie, they took her to the emergency room. They thought she had a bladder infection, but she actually had the flu. And uh, they did send her home, uh, but said she was very contagious. And the fact that they're not here today, I'm hoping that they did not uh, spread that through the house. Uh, I'm glad they, if they did, they did it at home and not here. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, uh, just uh, I tell you, there's a lot of illnesses going on right now. And so be in prayer as well as the uh, holidays, vacationing time. And uh, so uh, be in prayer one for another. Uh, don't forget about uh, Father's Day on the, on the 18th, I think it is. The 18th. Yes. Okay. Uh, oldest father, youngest father, and father with the most family members here. And uh, we, you know, sometimes I look across the crowd, Joan, I'm thinking, okay, now, if... Uh, this person's here, he's going to be the oldest, and this one here is going to be the youngest, and this one here usually has the most, you know, and we actually had a tie uh, for uh, the most family on Mother's Day. Uh, however, we didn't know that until after the fact, so the person that got, uh, you know, that worked out in my advantage, uh, but the person that got it, so uh, uh, I forgot about uh, Deb and Patty over in uh, the Children's Church. And I think they had six, and somebody else had six. So, <coughs> uh, and then I think the person that got it had five. Uh, so I'm going, yes, and they didn't complain. So we're okay. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, we'll do the same thing for the for the dads. Dads, you need to work hard. You know, say tell those kids, hey, look, you know, you came to church for mom. You better go to church for me, or I'm going to cut you off. You know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, no more money, no more uh, treats, no more, uh, just make them feel guilty, you know, just whatever it needs, whatever it takes, just, you know, so uh, if you have uh, someone who you consider a, uh, uh, a, a dad that uh, maybe your dad's gone and you have somebody who is a father figure to you, invite them to come as well uh, as those who are uh, grandpas to you. Uh, or whatever, I'm going to invite Brother Tim. Uh, you know, he's he, he's Papa anyway, so he's hiding up there in the crow's nest, I think. Yeah, I see his hand waving up there. Uh, 
you know, his birthday is one day after mine, so he thinks I'm I'm older than him. So uh, anyway, right, brother Tim? Yeah. <laughs> Considering the fact that I taught him in junior church when he was what eight years old, brother Tim. So I've known brother Tim for a long, long time. So be be here for that, and then also work towards the uh, anniversary service, 56 years. Uh, that's a, uh, a a great milestone. And uh, we're looking forward to having a great service then. All right. So just be apprised of all that's going on. Uh, pray one for another and uh, stay busy about the Lord's business. Let's stay. All right, page number 127. 127. Let's all stand. We'll have some men for our feet offering on the last quarter. 127. Trust in Jesus, to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, to know the said the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. came to this church of course it was way down over there and that was about 12 ish years ago there was usually about 20 people in the auditorium on Sunday mornings and not quite yet pastor then lamb had decided to get some of us guys together and go out soul winning you know we didn't have enough money to buy any tracks but we had a cabinet full of old tracks and we went through these old tracks from quite literally the 60s and 70s. We went through those and, and we ran out. We still didn't have any money to buy any new tracks. And we took up an offering and steadily kept asking people. And it took, I do believe, several months, if I remember correctly, Pastor, to get the, at that time, $600 up to buy some new tracks. We went through those. We still didn't have any money to buy tracks. So we did it again, and that time it only took us a couple weeks. And ever since then, we've never had to worry about it until today. Think about that. It's my special offering for tracks.
I can't do it alone. I have no idea how much they cost now, but 10, 12 years ago it was $600. We can't spread the gospel if we don't have anything with which to spread the gospel. I'm asking you all to do this. If you don't do this, if we don't get them, why are you coming here? If your job isn't to spread the gospel, why are you coming here? You receive the offering tonight. I ask Brother Philip to do something. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us here today. I want to thank you for the message this morning. I want to thank you for the one that you have for us tonight. Help us to take it up, to take it out into the world this week and apply it to our lives, Lord. Help us to be shining beacons and ambassadors for you, Lord. Lord, please help us to pay the bills here and to gather all that we need to spread the gospel, Lord. And all these things I ask and thank you for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. to First Peter chapter number three, First Peter chapter number three. We're going to look at this e <coughs> excuse me this evening at the verses eight through twenty two. That'd be verse eight through the end of the chapter. I'm not going to read the entire text right now. Uh, I am uh, going to break this down into three sections. I want to speak to you this evening on the blessings of unity. The blessings of unity. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the unity of mind, the unity of ministry, and the unity of cause. The unity of mind, the unity of ministry, and the unity of cause. When you look at Ephesians chapter number four, you could turn there if you'd like, um, and by way of introduction. In chapter number four, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus uh, speaks about the unity of God. In verse, uh, verse number two, he says, with all, let me start with verse one, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the uh, unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so Paul began speaking here of talking about the vocation that uh, we have. The child of God, we are uh, compelled uh, to look at the, at the ministry as a job, a work that we have. Now, we know that we're not saved by works. You know, the, the scripture is abundantly clear about that, and one of the favorite passages that we quote uh, and saying that our salvation is not by works but by grace is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and we're real adept in quoting uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works 
lest any man should boast. And we stop right there. And we make a big case that the ministry or the, the salvation that we have is based upon uh, uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and by the grace of God uh, that we are saved. And so we look at it by grace through faith. Uh, however, verse number 10 uh, continues that thought, says, Wherefore, uh, we are a, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It is our responsibility uh, not to work and labor for our salvation, but it is our responsibility as a child of God to, uh, to labor for the Lord. That's our responsibility. We have been called, I, I've said this before, but it bears repeating, Matthew 28, uh, verses 19 and 20 says, Go ye into all the world. And in the Bible, ye means y'all. All y'all. Okay? It doesn't exclude anybody. Everybody has a responsibility to go in the world and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then we are to teach them to observe what we have learned. We are to train. We are to replicate. We are to reproduce. In fact, I think John chapter 14 gives us that principle uh, when he says uh, uh, that Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit and so our responsibility as a child of God is to build the house of God the work of God uh, I was thinking recently uh, and uh, thinking about our church and thinking about the uh, the area that we're in uh, God has blessed abundantly uh, over the last 56 years we've seen greater attendance we've seen greater numbers there were times when we ran uh, 11 buses uh, those buses brought in at one time 308 people on the buses I think our high attendance was like 569 on one Sunday now let me tell you that the buildings that we had down the street were far inferior to what we have now we had a main auditorium our main auditorium was 30 foot wide and 67 feet long the whole building was 100 feet long, and in the back of that building, it had uh, Sunday school classes. We had an educational building that was 30 foot by 70 foot. And then we had our, we finally in 1985 built a fellowship hall, uh, which was uh, uh, 40 by 60, which is the same size as our fellowship hall is now. We didn't have all of the amenities that we had. For those of you who remember, we had uh, bathrooms in another building uh, the ladies, I think, had two stalls, and the men had one stall and a urinal, and that was it. Period. And to think that we took care of 569 people on one Sunday, I think we averaged at one point 389. Okay? Now, you say, what's the difference from then and now? Well, there's a lot of things that I could throw in there, but, you know, things happen and people get offended and people leave and, uh, and back and forth and economies change and, and all of that, and I'm not making an excuse, but the problem in most churches, and I think uh, it could be in ours too, is the idea of unity, the working together to accomplish a common goal. That's what unity is, working together. In fact, he says in Ephesians chapter number four, we have the unity of, notice here he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all if you come down into verse number uh, 11 it says that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the what purpose for the perfecting of the saints 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body and to the unto the edifying of itself in love now the purpose of the holy spirit number one is to seal us in christ we are sealed by the spirit we have the earnest of the spirit in christ so we are sealed. We are saved. Once we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are saved to the uttermost. You cannot be more saved than you are. You cannot be less saved than you are. You're saved. And when the Heavenly Father looks on you as a saved child of God, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees that you're saved. He sees that, that you have uh, uh, committed yourself to uh, be a part of the Lord Jesus Christ and a part of the family of God. You are adopted into the family of God. You're an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Christ. And so when we look at the responsibilities of the church, we are to be a unified body. So when we come back to 1 Peter chapter number 3, he's talking about, and as we studied through, we, he's talking about our relationship with the Lord. From chapter 1 through chapter number 3, it is our responsibility as Christians to, uh, to live the life that is pleasing to God. That is, that is our responsibility. As I said this morning, we, you know, our worship is, is wrapped up in the fact that we love God. If you come to church unprepared for service, if you come uh, to church unprepared uh, to receive what God has for you, it's not God's fault. We are to come prayed up, read up, and ready. Several people left this morning and, and commented to me and said, man, you, know, you read my mail. Well, no, I didn't read anybody's mail, just my own. In fact, if you look at my truck, most of my mail is stacked in the, on the, uh, uh, at the windshield because I just keep going to the post office and sticking it there. There's nothing important. Uh, I throw all the circulars away and all the trash away, and then I, I stack the important things that I need to take care of right there. Well, what's there? Well, the final bills for TXU, the final bill for, uh, for uh, Intex, the final bill for all of these things I had cut off and finally got turned back on at my new place after months. But, you know, the, the truth is, I don't read anybody's mail but my own. But the Holy Spirit reads your mail. Sometimes, I have, I've, at times, I've had people come and tell me, oh, well, you, you, uh, you said such and such in the message this morning. I said, I didn't say that. Oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> Somebody told Dr. Smith that one time for the sword of the Lord and said, you said such and such. And he goes, I didn't say that. He went back and listened to the to the CD, and he didn't say that. But what the what the person heard was what they needed for that purpose and for that position in their life. We are to be conformed to the image of God's Son. If we're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth, if we're <laughs> if we're going to honor Him with our lives, then our lives need to be in subjection to Him. Well, when we come down to chapter 3, let's look at verses uh, 8 through 11. The unity of the mind. Notice he says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one for another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, 
knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will uh, love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips uh, that uh, they speak no guile. Now, this finally here, he's referring back to chapter number two. When he talks about the children obeying the parents, when he's talking about the, the, <coughs> the uh, responsibility of, uh, of, that we have as Christians to submit to those that have the rule over us, for those who are servants to be sub, uh, in subjection to their masters, for those who are uh, wives to be in subjection to their husband, for the husband to love his wife and reverence his wife. I mean, all of these things he's talked about, he says, now finally, let's, let's draw this to a conclusion. Let's put this in a nutshell. Let's, let's compact it down so that you can understand what your responsibility in Christ is. Finally, my brethren, he says, be all of one mind. One mind. Is he talking about that we need to just take our brains and smash them together? And <laughs> No, no, no. He's not talking about, but he's talking about as far as a child of God, we're to think the same things. We're to think the same way. We are to use the Bible, the Word of God, as our litmus test. We're to use the Word of God as our guide, our handbook, our guidebook. Every business has a, uh, it, it, every successful business has a operations manual. Things that they will accept, things that they won't accept. At school, we have a, uh, a handbook. We have a staff handbook of what we expect of, of the staff. We have a student handbook of what we expect from the students and parents. And we do have expectations for the parents. Now, that is... That's telling us, okay, if you do this, 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 everything's cool. If you don't do this, everything's not cool. We, ha we have to have an operations manual. Well, God has given us the greatest of all operations ma operation manuals. This is our guidebook. This is, this is our manual to live. And he says, now then, what I want you to do is to be in one mind. Think the same way. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Philippians chapter number 2. What's he saying? We are to have the mind of Christ. We are to allow Christ and his thoughts to control our mind. Some of us are rebellious. We don't want nobody telling us what to do. We don't. I've heard kids say, I can't wait till I get old enough to be out on my own. Nobody can tell me what to do. And I just laugh. That's like the funniest joke I've ever heard. I'm sure that somewhere along the line that, <laughs> that I made that same statement. Unfortunately, I was out on my own on the thir by the age of 13, so I grew up pretty fast and realized I have responsibilities to take care of myself as well as to provide for myself. Some people have yet to grow up. <laughs> I was watching something on, on TV today or on, on Netflix, and... Uh, and, and the people are, are playing games. And their whole focus is, is focused in that game. You know that there are some men that will, that will sit there in front of a game uh, box or Xbox or whatever kind of games they are. And that's all they do is they just sit there and play games. They don't go to work. They don't clean up. They don't do anything. They just sit, they're focused on that game. And if they're one of those that gets up and goes to work, their thoughts and their conversation is all about that game. We have kids that play Call of Duty. I don't know what Call of Duty is. But they, they have all of these role plays and all these things that they do, and, 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 they, and they, 
they battle each other online and and, and all and that's what they do. And you know where it shows up? In their grades. Because that's all they do. You cannot be of one mind if you're not plugged in. Brother Philip. <laughs> Simplify. He's a Marine. I'm sure Brother Philip, when the drill sergeant was in boot camp, said, well, Sarge, I just don't really think I want to do that today. I think I, 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 think I want to take a week's vacation. <laughs> I think I want to call Mama. That drill sergeant, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that ain't happening. Why? Is because he needs those, that, that platoon to be of one mind. He needs them to work together. He needs them to, to ply and, 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 and plan and, and, and labor to a common cult goal, to a common core, to a common reason of why they're doing what they're doing. If the, if the military, the soldier, that chose their own way and did their own thing, we're not going to be in unity because everybody's, well, you know, I like that guy. Even though he's pointing a, you know, AK-47 at me, I mean, it really don't matter. You know, I like him. You know, well, that guy may not like you. You know, the, the soldier that has this idea of kumbaya, you know, and everybody's in agreement, and, everybody, and we're just going to dr come around the campfire and sing kumbaya. No, you're going to die. Why? Because you're not connected to the group. You're not of one mind. And the Bible teaches us we need to be of one mind. Notice what he says, in, in, uh, continuing on. He says, uh, of one mind, having compassion one of another. Having compassion one for another. Brother Kurt did a good job of explaining what that word compassion is. We think pity, we think empathy, but it's made up of two words, the, the, the prefix calm and the root word passion. Passion means to give oneself, one's life, as Jesus gave himself. We call it the passion of Christ. We ought to be willing as children of God, as the family of God, to have such a compassion and a care that we would give ourselves for somebody else. Jesus put it this way in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Jesus gave us the greatest example of laying down his life for his friends. You noticed when Jesus was crucified, while he was on the road as they were taking him to, be, to stand before Caiaphas and all, I mean, everybody forsook him. And at the, at the cross, they stood afar off. They didn't identify with his sufferings. It's interesting to note, as we go through, he talks about the fact that Christ died for us. That was his message. None of us are going to be without suffering. None of us are going to be without, without dealing uh, with, with issues in our lives. And the responsibility that we have is to suffer together. Lift one another up. Encourage one another. You notice he, he continues on. He says, having compassion. But notice he says also in verse number 8, one for another, love as brethren. Love as brethren. That love there is the agape love. That's the unconditional love. 
you know, we love people if they, if they do something good for us. If I'm sick and they bring me something, uh, bring me uh, uh, chicken noodle soup, which someone did back recently when I was sick, I, I appreciate that. Now, they get sick, so I have to make them a pot of chicken noodle soup and take it to them. And if I don't, then they're upset with me. A number of years ago, we had a, a lady in our church that she and I didn't see eye to eye. Not because I was taller and she was shorter. But she had a daughter, and her daughter was kind of a wild thing. I called names, some of you would know her and you would understand what I'm talking about. But I mean, these parents were such great parents as they, the child was like 10 years old and they gave her a pager. Remember the pagers? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm over here, some of y'all. So that when they got ready for her to come home, they would just send her a page to come home. Let her roam the neighborhood. And I'm going, oh, my soul. Bad parenting. <clears throat> Don't give your child a cell phone just to keep up with them. You ought to know where that child is at all times. In our society, you have to keep that child safe. The child may not appreciate it now, but one of these days they will appreciate it. Well, this child had a conflict with another student in our Sunday school class. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Uh, <clears throat> it was the girl's fault. I was there. But the mother had this idea that her daughter could never do anything wrong. And so I, she confronted me about it, and I told her what happened. Well, I'll just keep her, I'll just keep her and take her to my Sunday school class. I said, you're making a big mistake. <clears throat> because you're teaching her that she doesn't have to abide by the rules. You're teaching her that she's going to get her way. Well, I'm going to bring her up. Well, she did that. It happened, lasted about three weeks. And then she quit coming to Sunday school completely. <clears throat> you see... This lady thought I was her enemy. I wasn't her enemy. I was trying to help her with her child. When my grandpa died in Mississippi, we didn't have any money. But I went. And this lady brought a dish to the house covered in oil and she told her it was a, a, a cabbage, uh, some kind of cabbage dish. And she said, I don't open it until after I leave. We'll just go ahead and put it in the refrigerator. My wife did. Well, my wife liked cabbage, so uh, after she left, she opened it up. And there were $51 bills watered up like cabbage on that plate. You say, well, what's the difference? Because regardless of how close we are, how much difficult that we may have or misunderstanding we have we're to love unconditionally I was never unkind to her in fact the, the truth of the matter is that's why I keep saying pray one for another you say well I don't want to pray for them because I don't care for them pray for them your attitude will change towards that individual it will and so we have a responsibility. Not only that, he says in, in, the, in the next part of that, he says, be courteous. Be courteous. You don't have to be unkind when somebody doesn't do something that you want them to do. I love hamburgers. I love french fries. You get, I'll order a hamburger... And I'll say, I want mayo and no tomatoes. I don't know how many times and since I've been saved, I've gotten a hamburger with mayo and mustard. 
And not that I don't like mustard, I just don't like mustard on my hamburger. And tomatoes. And the yicky, juicy ones, you know? The ones that you can't just pull off and get rid of. I mean, all the little seeds are there. I hate tomatoes. Love ketchup, hate tomatoes. Doesn't make sense, I know. I didn't ask you to make sense of it. Some people would take that hamburger. In fact, I was reading some things on Facebook the uh, other day, and uh, people responses to not being served properly. People hollering and screaming and cussing and getting arrested and you know all that kind of stuff because somebody did something that they didn't like. One person ordered a fish sandwich from McDonald's, and they wanted tartar sauce on the side. They didn't have the little plastic containers to put the tartar sauce in. They had run out of them. And so they just put it in a uh, in a nugget box, and the lady was offended, threw a fit, threw the sandwich, threw the tartar sauce. It was all over the manager. Screamed and hollered and cussed and all of that, and they uh, finally, after they she assaulted the manager, she uh, 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 they called the police and hauled her off. Why? It doesn't make sense. The Christians are like that. You can be courteous all the time. Everybody has a bad day, believe me. Everybody has a bad day. But it shouldn't be taken out on somebody else. Be courteous. In fact, he gives warning here in the next verse. He says, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, uh, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love his life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. That's the ministry that we have. It, it, it is the unity of the mind. We are to be of one mind. Secondly, now that uh, he's talking about the unity of the ministry. Look at verse 12. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto the, their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of him that is good, of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, uh, accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Not everybody appreciates Christians. Not everybody wants to hear the truth. Brother Tim will remember this. I'll not call the young man's name. We had a film that we showed years ago. <laughs> I watched it the other day and I'm thinking, man, that is so poorly done. But the film had great results. It was called Hell. It was the movie on Hell. What is it? The Burning Hell. Yes. Thank you. Thousands upon thousands of people had watched that movie and been saved. And we showed the movie. This young man was in, was in the service and do you remember how old he was, Brother Tim? 10, 10, 11, 12, somewhere along in there. Rode my bus. And he got saved. He went home and told his family he got saved. Good thing. Boy, that daddy got mad. I went by the, the next Saturday to talk to him about coming to church. And boy, I got an earful. He had never allowed him to come back to church. 
never allowed him to, to have anything to do with the Bible or the Word of, Word of God from that point forward. Because we showed a movie about the dangers of hell and he got saved. I had somebody give me an address one time. Uh, somebody on my bus route, uh, some kids, and uh, they forgot to tell me one small T90 detail. Make sure you don't talk to the dad. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I remember almost to the exact house where it was. Chaparral Village. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had the names of the children, and I walked up to the door, and I knocked on the door, and being a, a man and children answering the door, I always asked, for, is mom or dad home? And the kids ran in and, and got dad. Told them there's a guy from church here. Well, the guy showed up at the door with a shotgun and a very real threat. You get off of my property or I will kill you. Don't ever come to this door again. You said, what did you, ha what did you do? I was very much led of the Spirit to leave the property. That's exactly what I did. Unfortunately, those children, unless something's happened since then, have never heard the gospel. Folks, there are people that are not going to like you. On the converse side of that, I've, had, I've gone and knocked doors, and, and I knocked on one trailer door one Saturday. I was by myself, and I went and I knocked on the door, and I, I never go into a house by myself. And it was rare that people would invite us in, but I knocked on this door, and I told the guy, he came to the door, and I, I told him who I was, and he said, his eyes got like saucers, and his jaw dropped, and he said, wow. He said, would you come in? I said, absolutely. And I went in and I sat down and, and started talking. He said, you know, I was just kneeling down right here by this couch praying that God would send somebody to help me know how to go to heaven. See, if I'd have stopped at those other doors and never gone out again and said, oh, well, this, I'm not going to do this. Look, look at all of the, the people that they don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to hear what's true. They don't want to hear anything. But there are those people out there that are searching for the truth. There's still those out there that, that, that are looking for something. They're looking for some hope. They're looking for some comfort. They're looking for some peace. Several years ago, I've lost track of her now, but there was a lady down at the, uh, uh, at the Denny's. We go in, Joe says, hey, pastor. So everybody in the place knows that I'm a pastor. So I have to be on my 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 P's and my Q's. We go in and we sit down and she comes over to me and and my wife and I are just sitting there and we're talking and, and she said, Would you would you please pray for me? I'm fixing to have a surgery and and uh, I'm really I'm really concerned about it and and I'm just really scared to uh, would you mind praying for me? I talked to her and found out when her surgery was and all of that had prayer with her. Then I knew when she was coming back and I made sure that I was there when she was back and talked to her. And she was so impressed that somebody would remember <coughs> and care for her. And I worked with her and worked with her and worked with her. Never got her to church. <coughs> but she knew that somebody cared. You see, our responsibility is to do what God has asked us to do. And, and verse number 15 says that, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give an answer. Jesus put it this way in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, he says, look, he said, Take no thought of what you shall say. Don't worry about how it's going to come out. Because the Holy Spirit will help you. One day, it was probably a couple of year, year, year or so ago, 
we had a group down from uh, from Lone Star Baptist College in Mesquite, and we were out door knocking, and the, the kid that was with me, and uh, it was my turn to talk, and so a uh, little boy came to the door. He was uh, uh, 10, 11 years old, and I started talking to him, and uh, we were, I just got on, on the subject of, you know, school and all that because, you know, he was in school asking what school he went to and, and all these things. And then we got on the subject of, of the gospel. And, you know, we got on the part about, you know, we've all sinned. I said, you know, do you always get 100 on every test? <coughs> he said, no, sir. <laughs> I said, what happens when you get don't get 100? He goes, well, sometimes I get in trouble. I said, right. So what happens when you get a hundred? Oh, it's, he said, my parents are happy about that. I said, I would be too. My parents would be thrilled if I got anything about passing. But, uh, and I started using that as a way to get into the gospel and teach him that there's a, that we're all sinners. And we, uh, and we, and we left. And uh, the young man that was with me, he, he, he looked at me and he goes, man, he said, that was a great illustration he said I've never heard that before how long have you used that and I said it came to me while I was talking to you you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's direction you don't know how this is going to go you don't know how it's going to work but God does and God knows exactly what every individual needs to hear but if you go out with the attitude that you're going to make this person get saved. You're going to make this person hear the gospel. You're, you've lost it. You're not. Years ago, we were visiting on my bus route. There was a, a mobile home there that people had just moved in. I knew it, and uh, I was with somebody, and it was their turn to talk. And so he knocks on the door, and the guy comes out and identifies himself immediately as an atheist. So this guy's not going to be undone. I mean, he's going to make sure that he's going to convert this atheist to Christianity just like that. So he's talking to the guy and the guy's just, you know, backing up. He said, look, he said, sir, I've already told you I don't believe that. I don't believe the Bible, uh, uh, the Word of God. I don't believe in God. I don't believe, you know, in heaven. I don't believe in hell. You know. And this guy steps, takes one step back, takes his bony finger, points to that guy and will just die and go to hell then. And I'm gone. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. I looked at the man. A tear came into my eye, and I said, Sir, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I said, You should have never said that. You said in this guy's pre in this guy's presence. You see, you're not going to convert everybody, but if you're unkind and you're mean spirited, you're not going to win anybody. Always leave somebody so somebody else can talk to them. Sometimes you talk to an individual and you're, you're you can't understand why they're so mean spirited about it, but they probably had some something like that Yehu, who's condemned them for something. In fact, it even says here that, that our life is to be, in a way, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Notice the word meekness. The word fear there is not, <gasps> it's reverence. It's the fear that we have for God. The reverence that we have for God. Do you realize that when you pull out a gospel track and you give to somebody that the Holy Spirit's going to use that because he prodded you to give that track? I'm amazed at the lady, the, the, the manager at the mall called and said, hey, could you send me some of those how to get to heaven from Texas tracks? I want to use them to, to give to people and and encourage them in, in helping them to reach to win Christ, to win them to Christ. We're talking about the manager at the mall. 
I know it's not a big mall, and I know it's not a good mall, but she does have a heart for the people that are there. Meekness and reverential fear. Lastly, notice that it's the unity of the cause. Let's, let's look at verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, let's look at, at verse 18. <clears throat> for Christ hath also suffered for our sins the just for the unjust. If we look at that in, in one way, we're saying Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for you. No. Jesus died for me. I was unjust. I was deserving of hell. Jesus took my sin debt upon him. And that should humble me enough to say, hey, that guy right there, he needs to know. He needs to know that Jesus loves him. You say, yeah, that guy will never get saved. You don't know that. We are not Calvinist here. We do not believe that God saves some and, and destines, other, destines some to hell. I don't believe that. I don't think that's biblical. I don't think that's scriptural. I think it's a lie of Satan. I think it's a way to keep people from witnessing to everybody. You look at some, some old guy, and you look at him and you go, that guy can never be saved. Look at him. But you're not God. And somebody might be looking at you and saying, man, you, you, there's no way that guy can be saved. I was telling Michael and my sister-in-law this afternoon, we are talking about working in prison and uh, working in Harris County jails. There's a guy that he was a gang leader for a gang in Cloverleaf. I mean, he was high up there. He, they busted him. He got put in prison. And Brother Bottom went by and talked to him. Robert Bottom, one of our missionaries, went by and talked to him, and, and uh, he's in solitary for his own protection. Because if he was in general pop, he would be dead in a very short period of time. And all you can see is you have, it, 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 if you've ever been in this prison, there's a, there's a crack in the door where the door slides this away. There's a crack down this side and a crack down this side, and that's it. There's no mesh. There's nothing. And I was standing where I could look in to this guy. He's got 666 tatted across his forehead. He's got all kinds of gang symbols tattooed all over his face and his arms, his body. One of the sweetest, most compassionate, men I've talked to in a long time. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He said, well, if he got saved, he shouldn't be in solitary. It's for his own protection. In fact, even being in that contained cell, he could die. Things happen in prison that you have no clue happens. Had a glowing testimony. He got out one time 
and he was doing really good. And he got one of his old buddies contacted him, wanted him to go somewhere with him. And he went with him, and he got in trouble, got put back in, because he was in the wrong place, the wrong time, with the wrong person. He said, "He said, preacher. He said, I just, he said, I didn't do anything. He said it was just who I was with. I messed up." You see, you can look at people. You can see the bomb on the street and say, man, that guy looks smelly. He has a soul in need of salvation. Jesus died for you. And Jesus died for me. See, the, the, the cause of the ministry or the ministry of the cause is the fact that we have a responsibility to reach our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some may have taken offense to Brother, Brother uh, Kurt saying about the tracks and, and getting tracks and, and all. I don't know how much money I had in my pocket. I had the 20 and some ones. I have nothing until payday. Absolutely nothing. But I, I felt the Lord say, hey, you need to give to that. But Brother Kurt didn't tell you one time was when we were needing tracks, there was one man in our church that bought the entire lot himself. You see, we have responsibilities. And if the ministry is not first and foremost in our lives, if it's not the first thing we think about when we look at a soul, when we look at a person, I think it was Miss Charlene and I were talking this morning after the service. She said, man, you read my mail. And I said, no, I didn't read anybody's mail but my own. And she said, uh, she watches those old um, uh, Perry Mason reruns. I don't know about you, Miss Charlene, but I watched them the day they aired probably <laughs> before they were reruns. Love black and white. And on those shows, I Love Lucy, Perry Mason, all of those older shows, like everybody smokes. Even in Andy Griffith, Andy smoked. And she said, you know, sometimes I sit there and I watch those and I think, man, I really like a cigarette. And she said, I had smoked in 22 years. <laughs> you say, what is that? We look at people and, and we make a determination based upon their, their looks or their actions. or you know Some people don't like to knock doors in, in wealthy neighborhoods because they don't care. They've got everything they need. They they're not worried about it. But what you don't know behind there, they're the most miserable people in the world. Well, they have it all, but they have nothing. They have no peace. They have no comfort. Their family's in a shambles. They're probably living from, from paycheck to paycheck just like we are because they're so far in debt because they've got to keep up that image. But we're not going to knock doors in Country Club because we're not going to knock doors in, uh, in uh, any of the other nicer neighborhoods because nobody cares. I had one friend tell me one time we were out knocking. He said, let's go find the 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 the, the lowest class of people we can and win them to Jesus. I'm not opposed to that. But you know why he wanted to go to the lowest class? Because they know they have a need and they're willing to listen. Something that's going to help them. They're, they're willing. And you can get 10, 15, 20 people in one Saturday to make a, to make a commitment to Christ. But you go knock on 75 doors in a ritzy neighborhood and you might get one person that will even talk to you. And probably nobody who will respond at all. Kind of like selling Electrolux vacuum cleaners door to door. It's not easy. I did it, I know. Folks, it's the unity of the mind, the unity of the ministry, and the unity of the cause. That Peter is writing here saying, look, 
there's going to be persecution. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tests. There's going to be people that don't understand. I didn't read in any of these verses that we were excused from any of these principles simply because somebody made fun of us. Somebody laughed at us. Uh Uh-uh. We just have a mandate to go and to be what we ought to be. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you this evening for your blessings. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to realize, Lord, that we have a responsibility to our community. Lord, we have a responsibility to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, whether it be uh, someone staying on the street corner, whether it be a banker in a beautiful business suit, we all have responsibility. Lord, help us to be aware Help us, Lord, to do what we need to do that we might honor and serve you and glorify you in our lives. Father, I pray that our church would once again take flight and grow. Lord, we've seen you do it in the past. We want to see it again. We don't want to dwell in the past and say this is what we used to do, but Lord, what we're doing now to reach the people with the gospel of Christ. Lord, give us a heart for souls. Give us a heart for ministry. Lord, help us to have a heart for you and for your work. Bless the invitation is our prayer. In Jesus' name, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed.